All right, so welcome to week six, the uh, Blackboard Collaborate session for this week. Uh, just a bit of quick overview for what we're going to be doing today. Uh, we're going to be starting off by looking through the slides from the uh, this week's video lecture. I'll take some questions for a little bit, and then we're going to go through the discussion board, uh, the weekly discussion topic. Uh, the uh, last three weeks worth of discussion topics, and then we'll do some more questions. All right, so let's talk about the evaluative argument. All right, so at its simplest, evaluative argument is review, giving an opinion on the quality based on your own criteria of the subject. So what you're basically doing is telling us what your subject, whether your subject is good or not based on whatever you've decided are the standards that you want to set, hold it against. Now, evaluations have more persuasion than minimal research. Uh, you have to understand that the, uh, uh, <clears throat> so what you have to understand here is that it's going to be uh, something that doesn't really require a lot of, of, of doesn't really require a lot of research okay you have to be so all the research you really have to do is based on her uh is, i'm sorry i'm distracted here it's going to be based on your uh experience with the subject okay and persuasive nature of an evaluation makes it different from a typical movie or restaurant review that simply note the good points and bad points of the thing being evaluated. Now, that's what Yagelsky says. I will say, though, that in recent years, this has been no longer the case because media reviews in particular almost always are going to take a side. Okay. They're doing more to assess quality than they are just to tell you this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. Okay. All right, so to get an idea about the kind of writing we're talking about, I want you to try to pra practice some. This is the exercise that I have set up in the, uh, this is the first exercise I have set up in the questions of the professor thread. Now, there is one thing that's slightly upsetting about this, and that is that uh, this class has not done any of those exercises in the last two weeks. Okay, uh, week five's thread, the only post that's there is my post that is setting it up. Uh, and the three week six threads have not even been touched yet. Okay, uh, this needs to be done. Okay, we, uh, I'm asked, I'm not grading these. However, uh, I am requesting that you do them because they are practice. They are something that's going to give you the skills that you need and the understanding that you need to complete the assignments. Okay, so if you aren't, if you haven't done it yet, and obviously nobody has, uh, you need to do them. Okay, so the setup for the first uh, thread on questions of the professor. Previously used textbook presented an example of comparing cell phones, which was quite dated. We're going to be doing an updated version. Uh, I want you. To, I want you to research some of the features, if possible, on the an iPhone and an Android phone. Uh, first off, say which phone you prefer and why. And then second, assess which phone would be recommended for these four uh, hypothetical individuals. We have a grandmother trying to keep in touch with her family. We have a starting college. We have a single mother who needs to be in contact with her work consistently. And we have a family of four looking for multiple phones to keep in touch at all times. All right. Uh, and I do tell you that because there's multiple, there's so many different models of Android phones, to assume for the purpose of this exercise that the Android phone is the latest Samsung Galaxy model. And in the video lecture, I've told you that there are some mitigating factors that each of these people will have uh, in regard to what type of phone, what type of phone they're going to want. Okay. Uh, next, approaches to evaluations. Uh, the main one we're looking at is the criteria match process, where you're going to compose a series of criteria as to what determines quality in your mind, then line up the evaluation subject against those criteria and determine whether it meets those criteria or not. Okay? Criteria will be the primary arbiter of good or bad in this process. Okay? So 
uh, that's how you're going to set up your standards, what you're going to be doing to uh, judge your subject on whether it's good or not. Okay? Now, forgive me here. I'm doing one thing real quick. There we go. All right. Good. Okay. So the met criteria, uh, the subject does not have to meet all the criteria to be judged as good. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have to meet every single requirement. It, if it meets most of them and you can still consider it good, that would work. If it meets only a few of them and you can still consider it good, that still works. Okay. As long as you can justify why you say it's good. Okay, the met criteria then become the reasonings behind your evaluative argument. The ex first, ex the example I gave you here uh, is the uh, video from How It Should Have Ended, their their review of Wonder Woman. Okay, so I asked you to ask, I asked you what the reviewer's criteria are for his review. Okay, uh, to try to think of what what he's looking for, and we talked a little bit about this in the lecture. Okay, he. Coming, approaching it from the viewpoint of being a superhero, uh, a knowledgeable superhero expert. Okay, uh, he has certain expectations of you what you want in a superhero film in an origin story, and specifically for Wonder Woman. Okay, and those are the criteria he sets up for his uh, review. Now, the only thing that he said that was kind of lacking was the uh, big bad villain uh, Hades or Hades uh, Ares. Okay. The big bad villain wasn't exactly as fulfilling as what he wanted. Okay. So here's the, so the next part is some issues that regard uh, in regards to criteria. Okay. First off, purpose and context. It's important to keep in mind the context of the subject being evaluated as well as the context and background of the evaluator. Writers' inherent biases and or pack, background will influence the criteria used. As I mentioned, how it should have ended review of Wonder Woman is from the perspective of a superhero fan, implying he is at the very least familiar with the comic book source material. Uh, at one point, he actually does say that he was wondering why they cast Gal Gadot because uh, Wonder Woman is supposed to be muscular, okay? And he didn't think she's, he initially thought she wasn't up to the task uh, to be uh, Wonder Woman, but eventually changed his mind. <laughs> All right, some other special problems you have to consider for criteria. One is different classes. Subjects should be compared only to other members of their class or category. Bless you. Do not compare apples to oranges. Okay? Uh, you should be comparing your subject to other like subjects, okay, if you're going to do any comparisons at all. So in the case of Wonder Woman, I would not be – you could make an argument to compare it with other uh, feminist genre films. In fact, the one that uh, immediately comes to mind is uh, Mad Max Fury Road. I would, I would do a comparison to that. Uh, but I would not compare it to something like Little Women, okay? Or any kind of prestige piece, a kind of Oscar bait type of film. It's a compare, okay? There's, there's really no way to compare the two. Uh, think about competing standards, perfection versus reality. Be upfront in regards to whether the criteria being used for evaluation is ideal or even achievable. Okay, uh, So you need to be aware that maybe you're setting your standards a little too high. Okay, And if you find yourself setting your standards too high, you may have to try to alter those standards a little bit. Uh, then seductive empirical methods, rationalizing everything into numbers. Good evaluations take the non-quantifiable into account in addition to anything that can be quantified, okay? So do not be uh, tempted to turn everything into a numerical value, even though that's really an easy way to assess quality. Uh, it's not always going to work, okay? So don't think that everything has to be converted to numbers, okay? Uh, then tyranny of cost. Is something automatically better because it's more expensive? The quick answer to that is no. Especially when it comes to things like movies because typically a uh, film blockbuster is going to spend humongous amounts of money. Uh, and if it's written well, you're going to wind up with something like Wonder Woman or you're going to wind up with something like, uh, just as a for instance here, you'll wind up with like Avengers Endgame. 
if it's written poorly, you blown all that money on a Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. Okay? <clears throat> so keep that in mind. Just because it's more expensive does not necessarily mean that it's better. <clears throat> okay? Then we have necessary, sufficient, and accidental criteria. Okay? Uh, so sufficient criteria is the baseline nominal criteria. It's basically it's the least you need to get by. Okay? So... Whatever it is that you are uh, evaluating, it has to have this stuff in order to basically qualify as what it is that you're evaluating it as. Okay? Uh, so that is suffi sufficient criteria. Necessary criteria is what you feel is acceptable. It's not necessarily the bare minimum. It is basically what you feel needs to be in addition to the bare minimum in order for it to be quality. Okay? Not, again, not necessarily the same as sufficient. For instance, a job which gives you a lot of time for your family that pays nearly nothing can be described as necessary but not sufficient, okay? Because not all criteria are met, okay? You have the necessary in that you have the time, but the sufficient is that it, the money is severely lacking and you don't have it live on, okay? So uh, that's sufficient versus necessary criteria. Then you have accidental criteria which are added bonuses which are neither necessary or sufficient, but are nice to have, okay? They're not required, uh, they're not sufficient, they're not necessary, but they're something that you happen to discover that is an added benefit and makes the quality that much better, okay? <clears throat> All right, so when we're developing evaluation arguments, the development of arguments for evaluation is very similar to that for classical arguments. Every claim needs to have a and evidence to support that reasoning. Only in this case, we're not doing so much in terms of uh, research, okay? As I mentioned at the top here, for evaluation, typically the only research you need to do is experience with the subject that you are uh, evaluating. Going one step further, in evaluation arguments, there is also an underlying criterion which is the basis for that claim and reasoning and should also additionally be supported by evidence and arguments. So basically, when you come up with your criteria, that is going to be the basis for your arguments. That's going to be the basics for your basis for your reasonings. Okay. Now, this is the second uh, activity I want you guys to do on uh, questions to the professor. And again, as I mentioned before, this section has not done any of these acti lecture activities in the last two weeks. So those activities need to be need to be done because they are vital practice. It gets your mind in the right place so that you know what to expect and you know what you're supposed to be doing. Okay? So, for this particular uh, uh, question of the professor, this is what you need to do. Uh, you need to uh, evaluate this argument that's, that's on this slide and looking for four key things. One is the claim and the reason for that claim. Okay? Uh, what is each claim that this reviewer makes? Uh, what is the evidence to support the reason? Okay? What is the underlying assumption or criterion based on what's presented? What is What are, type of the criteria is he using to uh, judge this work? And then the fourth is evidence or arguments to support the assumption or criterion. Okay? So you're looking for his reasons for the claims, the evidence to support the reasons, and then the criteria and the evidence for those criteria. Okay? Now, the other sections have gotten kind of confused because they have responded to this uh, uh, exercise. However, they did it with the wrong review. Okay? I've had four responses in the other, uh, among the other three sections, uh, and they've all used the how it should have ended review as the basis for their answer. Problem is, that's the wrong review. The review I want you to work with is the second one uh, from the cri the Critical Drinker. Uh, it's titled Wonder Woman. Was it really that good? Okay. Uh, if you recall in the lecture, I did mention that this person, it, this particular reviewer, is especially salty and extremely Scottish. Okay. So, uh, in fact, one of his. Gr I'll give you a quick, uh, freebie here. One of his gripes about the movie was the portrayal of a Scottish character uh, who he basically says uh, they they tried to do a multicultural uh, team 
as part of the movie, and one of the guys in it is a drunken Scottish jerk. Okay, uh, and he he took umbrage at that. Uh, and then the next example uh, of an evaluation is the EMP. Okay, this is the third one. Okay, this is the third one that's at uh, questions of the professor. Uh, this this particular evaluation is a student evaluation that I have provided to you. It is under the uh, video. It's under the slides for this week. Uh, this is a, the essay is in question. It's in a word file. Uh, this is an essay written by a student named Jackie Wingard from uh, University of Washington. It's evaluating a museum called the Experience Music Project EMP in Seattle, Washington. Okay, so for that other for this third exercise, this is what I want you to do. I want you to uh, read through Jackie's essay, uh, read it critically, and answer these questions. First off, how did Jackie Wingard compare the EMP facility to the criteria presented? Second, pick out the reasons why the EMP does or does not meet a criteria according to Wingard. Then third, I want you to do your own re online research on EMP. Uh, as I as I mentioned in the lecture, you have to search for it as uh, part of the Seattle Museum of Pop Culture. Uh, if you leave that part out, most likely the results you get back are going to be a lot of stuff about electromagnetic pulses. Okay. So without any in-person experience with the EMP, would you agree with Wingard's valuation? Why or why not? Okay. So, uh, again, read through that article, answer these questions on the uh, thread at Questions of the Professor. And with that being said, here is the last part of this, and this is the assignment itself. Okay? So, your evaluative argument essay is going to be due on October 22nd at midnight. All right? Uh, there's going to be two workshops for this. One of the first one is going to be the week of October 12th. Okay? That's the revision workshop. And then the week of October 19th is the proofreading and editing workshop. Okay, and let me just make sure here of the dates. Is that the due date for this is actually the 23rd of October, uh, but on the 22nd that's when the link will become live. Okay, so uh, revision workshop the week of October 12th, and then proofreading and editing is the week of October. Uh, you'll be writing evaluation of a particular subject. There's no requirements in terms of what you evaluate. It has to be something you have good familiarity with. For instance, if you choose to evaluate a film, you should have watched the film at least twice to give a fair evaluation. So whatever it is you decide to evaluate, it has to be something that you have good experience with, a lot of experience with, uh, enough experience so that you can give a fair evaluation of it. Now, as part of the assignment, I also want you to have a clear set of criteria for your evaluation. I am going to ask you to include a list of your criteria along with your drafts when you turn the assignment in. Okay, uh, that is not to say that you cannot. The, you also need to in the text of the essay. You also need to integrate the criteria in a way that we can tell how it is you're evaluating the subject. Okay, but in addition to that, I need a explicit list of your criteria. Okay, so that needs to be turned in along with the essay. So the, essay, the requirements for this essay, okay, uh, it is three to five pages long. It should be double spaced, 11 to 12 point font. This will be Times New Roman, Arial, or Calibri. Uh, a worksite page will not be required for this essay as your evaluation should only have a single research source, that is the evaluation subject. Now, if you do further research, though, you will need a works cited page. Uh, it's going to be recommended for you. Uh, the evaluation should be organized so that your criteria, criteria for evaluation can be determined from the context of your writing. This is why I also want to have the list with me so that I can see that you are presenting that, those criteria in context. Okay? All right, so that does it for the slides for this week. Uh, we'll do some brief questions and answers, uh, brief question Q&A session, and then we'll take a look at the discussion board. Okay? So... Uh, anyone with any questions, go ahead, raise your hands, uh, and I will, uh, so I recognize you guys, you can ask away.
Okay, Vanek, I see you there. What's your question? Are we done with the first argument essay? Yes, we are. Uh, we're, there's nothing else we're doing on the classical argument. We're moving on to the evaluative argument. Okay. So as, as long as you have turned in that essay, you are you in with it. Okay. I will say that I have, ter I have graded the essays that I've received uh, from this section. Uh, let me just double check here, make sure nobody else has turned one in. Uh, I have seen nine essays come in. Uh, and no others. Okay, so uh, I have graded all the ones that have come in for this section. All right, if there's no more questions this time, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go move on to the second part of this where we're going to be taking a look at the most recent topics on the uh, discussion board. Okay, but first off, I uh, want to take note here again, uh, as I mentioned, we've had very little participation on the lecture exercises. Uh, we're starting to get diminishing returns on this, okay? Uh, People for sure did the icebreaker. Uh, we had eight people do, or seven people do the uh, week two le lecture exercise. Had two people do week three. One person did week four. And no one has done any for week five or week six. So uh, again, these exercises are not graded. However, they are good practice. Uh, and if you want to improve your grade, the best thing you get, best thing you to grade on these essays is to practice. So these are supposed to allow you to practice writing uh, about those topics. Uh, they're allowed you to write about that type of uh, writing. And they're intended to get your mind in the right place for writing those particular types of essays. OK? So I do strongly recommend that you need to do those exercises. OK? Now, as far as the weekly discussion topics go, OK? Uh, we have had uh, three more weeks, so we're going to do the uh, week four through six topics here, the brief overview of what to expect with those. If you have not responded already, uh, most I think most of the people in here have probably already responded, uh, but just in case, we're going to go through the topics uh, one by one. So starting with week four, uh, week four's topic is a sports risk rewards quandary. Oh, one other thing I'm going to put out here is that I'm going to use this use this time here to give you any further information that has occurred in regards to these topics since I wrote these or since I wrote them up. 
Okay, so discussion for week four. The pandemic has caused a lot of regular living disruptions around society at large. Among the first casualties of the measures to fight the disease was sports leagues. As in America, the NBA and NHL were forced to stop their seasons within a couple of months of their respective playoffs commencing, and Major League Baseball with its spring training activities. This was not a uniquely American phenomenon, as in Asia, baseball leagues halted, halted play, and most notably the English Premier League halted its season a month prior to its conclusion. For much of the late spring and early summer, there was no talk sports to speak of at all. When they resumed, it was under limited conditions. Major League Baseball started a shortened 60-game season in July with no live crowds in attendance, and one team, the Toronto Blue Jays, temporarily relocated to Buffalo, New York, after Canadian officials refused to let the team play in their regular home. The NBA and the NHL resumed their seasons with a limited slate of teams, only those who had not already been eliminated from the postseason, within bubbles where the teams could play and live quarantined. For the NBA, it was at Walt Disney World in Orlando, while the NHL set up two bubbles in Edmonton and Toronto to allow conference playoffs to go on. Late last week, it was announced that MLB would only institute the bubble for the World Series, which they chose to play at Globe Life Park in Arlington. I need to amend that slightly because uh, Major League Baseball is actually going to set up four bubbles. Uh, there's going to be two for each league uh, starting in the division series, uh, which probably will be starting next week. Uh, and then they will go on to two, they'll be reduced down to two bubbles for the uh, league championship series. Uh, American League, American League's uh, championship series will be placed in San Diego. Uh, National League will be played in Arlington. And the World Series is going to be played in Arlington. The greater test also began this past weekend as college football entered its second week and the NFL began play. College football has already been deeply affected as three conferences chose to not play this fall, two of them being Power 5 major differences. The Pac-12 and the Big Ten are not playing in the fall. And that needs to change as well. Big Ten is going to start at, uh, on the weekend of October 23rd, and the Pac-12 is planning to start in the first weekend of November. It has also been affecting attendance by crowds as each college has made its own call on whether to allow, re allow reduced crowds to attend controversial issue because some of the schools that are choosing to play football in the fall are heavily affected by COVID-19 on campus. Most infamous of these being Alabama, which not only has been having widespread outbreaks on campus, but also having school officials try to, to prevent widespread information out of them getting to the press, even its own campus newspaper. The NFL has played almost its week one games to empty stadiums with very few exceptions. One notable one, the Kansas City Chiefs allowed just over 3,000 fans to attend their Thursday night game. For your discussion this week, compare the ways other sports have handled the pandemic and debate for or against playing a football season, either college or professional, this fall. If you feel it is safe to play, how can fears be assuaged that players and personnel won't contract COVID-19 and spread it in their communities? What lessons can be learned from what the NBA, NHL, and MLB have done in their respective leagues, bubbles, and or limited attendance? Do those lessons fully pertain to football, or how can they be applied to ensure a safe season? There are five resources to go along with this topic. Uh, first one is actually one that uh, constantly updates. That's from NCAA.com. Uh, it's their most recent COVID-19 policies in regards to fall, season, fall sports. Uh, next one, Sporting News, uh, covering the NFL. New York Post, covering uh, Major League Baseball. Uh, ESPN.com, covering the NHL. And uh, GQ, covering the NBA. Now... <clears throat> Some updates to uh, this particular topic. Uh, the NHL has completed their season uh, as of early this week. Uh, they completed the Stanley Cup Finals, uh, uh, only went to six games. Tampa Bay Lightning won the Stanley Cup. Uh, they were able to complete their season without having a single outbreak. Uh, the NBA is now moving into the NBA Finals. Uh, currently, it's the, uh, the only two teams left are the Los Angeles Lakers and the Miami Heat. Uh, they also have managed to avoid outbreaks. Uh, major League Ball, during its shortened season, wound up having two major outbreaks. One of them actually occurred after only a week of play. The Miami Marlins uh, had a COVID-19 outbreak, and then uh, two weeks later, the St. Louis Cardinals had an outbreak. Okay, uh, and we've already had one in the NFL as well. Uh, the most recent bit of news on COVID-19 in the sports: uh, the Tennessee Titans 
have uh, announced that eight people, including three players, tested positive. So their uh, Sunday their Sunday game is now in jeopardy. Uh, then they've gone into uh, basically a lockdown. They've uh, canceled all team activities uh, until Saturday. <clears throat> Uh, their opponent is also watching uh, their own personnel. Their, their opponent for this past Sunday was uh, the uh, Minnesota Vikings. Uh, they have not yet reported any. Uh, <clears throat> they've not yet reported any cases, but they're keeping an eye on the situation. Okay. So uh, those are some things to consider as you try to answer this question. So let's go to week five. The week five prompt is called Wildfire Storms and the Climate. And here's your discussion. <clears throat> Aside from the numerous sources of the news recently that have arisen in terms of United States politics and the worldwide pandemic, the biggest story has been the rising wildfires up and down the west coast of the U.S., which have changed the sky to an apocalyptic orange color over San Francisco and Los Angeles and led to smoke advisories from Seattle to San Diego. Some of these fires were started through negligence. The El Dorado fire, for instance, was started by an explosive device used for a gender reveal party, while others were from natural causes. The end result, however, is the same as the fire rampages through these states, and much of the damage has been attributed to climate change, creating the perfect conditions for these fires in the way of drought. What has fallen to the wayside, however, is another effect usually attributed to climate change, the increase of tropical storm activity in both the Pacific and the Atlantic. More hurricanes and tropical storms than normal have arisen this year, so that only for the second time ever, NOAA's Hurricane Center has reached the end of their list of hurricane names before the last tropical storm of the season formed. The last time this happened was 2005, the year of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. In both that year and this year, the storms formed after the list was exhausted or designated with Greek letters. As of writing this, Tropical Storm Beta was approaching the coast of Texas. When this happened, the final storm of the season was recorded in the middle of December and was designated as Hurricane Zeta, the sixth storm after the end of the name list. Tropical storm activity is usually attributed to climate change because of the rising temperatures of the oceans, which feed the storms and make them stronger. Climate change has been a deeply debated issue, even as the wide consensus of scientists agree that it is happening and must be reversed. Some politicians, however, choose to disregard science when it is inconvenient to the narrative they want to present to their voters and tend to dispute climate change with great fervor. For your discussion this week, argue for or against action that could be taken to lessen the impact of wildfires or hurricanes, or for, or for or against action to address climate issues. How would you approach the discussion considering the passionate attitudes on both sides? What would your goal be in entering the discussion? I have seven sources for this particular discussion topic. Uh, we have from CNN, California governor emphasizes wildfires show reality of climate change. Uh, we have CNBC, the West Coast is suffering from some of the worst air quality in the world. These apps show how bad it is. <clears throat> we have the New York Times, some of the planet's most polluted skies are now over the West Coast. Uh, we have Scythe Daily, between fire and hurricane, U.S. West Coast on fire while Hurricane Sally hits Gulf Shores. Uh, the Conversation, the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season is so intense it just ran out of storm names, and then two more storms formed. Uh, Grit, the 2020 hurricane season is tearing through the alphabet at LMOP speed. And then Market Watch, how the 2020 hurricane season could end up rivaling the worst on record. Okay, so all those sources there for you to consider when you're crafting your answer for that one. <clears throat> okay. This was just posted on Monday, week six topic, fighting hate through creative means, okay? So here is the uh, topic for you. Over the last few years, as more and more hate groups grow more emboldened to operate in the open, it has become a conundrum for those confronting the hatred as to how to respond. Much of the problem has been identified by online service providers, such as Facebook and Reddit, who are consistently trying to combat hate speech on their platforms by tagging posts and banning groups and individual posters. However, there are other avenues that have been tackled to confront the issue. Among these avenues includes businesses removing products either endorsed or supported by white supremacist groups. After the Night to Right, the right rally in Charlottesville in 2017, the Tiki Torch Company emphasized through their social media that they wanted no association with the marchers, who carried the company's product in a threatening manner while chanting racist slogans in the night. Intellectual property owners have responded to the conscription of their trademarks into white supremacist channels. 
The Detroit Red Wings launched a lawsuit against approving their winged wheel logo with alterations for trademark infringement, while Matt Fury, the creator of the popular Pepe the Frog mascot that was adopted via 4chan by the alt-right, responded by killing off the character in his comics. <clears throat> Most recently, after learning that the Proud Boys used one of their products as a de facto uniform, British fashion company Fred Perry announced that the particular shirt, commonly called the Black Yellow Yellow Twin Tipped Shirt, would no longer be available for purchase in North America until its association with the Proud Boys was confirmed to be set. For your discussion this week, talk over the ways that corporate entities can deal with hate groups and dissociate themselves. What could the control do the companies have over the groups using or misusing their products? How effective can actions like Fred Perry's and Matt Fury's be in combating the association with these hate groups? Should more companies take the tactics of the Detroit Red Wings, or are they limited in their legal means to redress the bad associations? Okay. We have uh, four sources for this one. Uh, first off, the New York Times, tarnished by Charlottesville, Tiki Torch Company tries to move on. Uh, second, Detroit Free Press, why were white nationalists using the Detroit Red Wings logo in Charlottesville? And we have the verb, Pepe the Frog is officially dead. And finally, the fourth one is simply called Proud Boys Statement. It is a press release that was issued by the Fred Perry Company. Okay, one other thing I should note about this topic. Uh, the Fred Perry Company, uh, Fred Perry has tried to distance themselves as much as possible from the white supremacist uh, content, or uh, white supremacist uh, element that uh, likes their product. Uh, that's why they issued the uh, statement about the Proud Boys. Uh, they made... Uh, clear that it went counter to the company's uh, politics. Uh, however, one as one person, as one reporter has also noted, uh, Fred Perry shirts uh, have previously had a bad association that they may not have done anything about, and that is in the 80s. Uh, Fred Perry shirts became a again a de facto uniform uh, for British heads. Okay, so. <clears throat> uh, so these are the current uh, discussion topics, the most recent three. Uh, as always, just just so you know, you have until uh, the end of the semester, which is the first December, to finish this discussion board. It actually locks on December 4th. So... One sentence reply. I'm going to state right here that if you're if the response that you post to the discussion board is less than three paragraphs, it will not count. Okay, so make sure that you are doing the full length of the uh, response that you need to for those discussion topics. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, open it up for one more round of questions. Uh, if anybody has any further questions about the uh, uh, anybody has any further questions about the uh, uh, discussion board or about uh, upcoming essays, upcoming assignments, anything like that? Uh, now it's time to ask. Go ahead, raise your hand and get, shoot that question to me. Place that you by provide feedback on your papers. Okay, the. Uh, if you uh, click on the uh, the paper, I believe you should be able to see my feedback if you click on the paper in eCampus because I do write extensive notes, okay? Uh, there is actually a breakdown of what the way the grade works, uh, how I grade it, and it's also going to have some comments in it, all right? Uh, just FYI, the way that these papers are graded, I use a five-category rubric for grading these. Uh, one, each each category worth 20 points. So 20 points for grammar, spelling, and mechanics. Uh, 20 points for uh, detail. 20 points for readability. 20 points for focus. And then 20 points for adhering to the assignment. Okay, in this case, a classical argument. I will say that after grading a number of papers, both in this in this section and uh, in the other sections, I've seen a lot of people who uh, really didn't get that this was supposed to be an argument, and I've seen at least eight or nine papers that I've received uh, 
were not arguments. They were some other type of writing. Most of them were either reflective essays or they were uh, exploratory essays that did a lot of fact-finding and zero arguing. Okay? <clears throat> so... Uh, you should be able to uh, click on that assignment and see the notes that I get that I left for it. Uh, let me see here. There we go. Uh, you're not seeing a grade there because I haven't received a paper from you. As I, as I said, I've graded all the ones I received. I received a total of nine essays. So if you don't have a grade on, it's because I did not receive your paper. Hang on a second here. There may, there's also been a lot of weird stuff going on with eCampus. I'm going to take a look at it. Okay, the essay I'm looking at right now, that I do have notes in your works cited area, okay? Uh, as far as the grade itself, uh, the grade itself, I didn't have any further comments because it was actually fairly decent. Uh, but the, the essay, if you look at the uh, essay itself, I highlighted a lot of stuff in your works cited, and there's comments down there. Okay, uh, uh, another big thing that a lot of people had trouble with for this was the work cited uh, aspect of it. Uh, a lot of people were out of the uh, pr proper format, so I was basically trying to coach you guys on uh, what you're supposed to do with those, okay? <clears throat> All right, so if uh, nobody else has any questions here, uh, about we got about the, uh, uh, it's 12.46 now, and I need to prepare for the second session. Uh, so I'm going to end the recording here, and 
uh, let you guys take off. Uh, continue to work on the stuff. Make sure you guys are working on the uh, lecture exercises as well as the uh, discussion boards uh, every week. And uh, we'll be coming back here same, t same time as usual, uh, talking over next week's lecture. Uh, should have some fun with that one. We'll be looking at some uh, examples of reviews. So I will see you guys then.